Hey guys, welcome back. It's lesson 32. We're going to continue our discussion of scattering with the Born approximation, and we're going to get into some nuclear physics today with the empirical mass formula. So let's begin with the, the uh, Born approximation. The idea is uh, it's a different way to attack the scattering problem from the partial wave analysis we've been doing. It, uh, it doesn't in any way rely on the spherical symmetry of the potential, so you can easily or more straightforwardly, I guess, handle non-symmetric potentials. And uh, the other thing is it works best if the potential is weak. So uh, compared to, say, the kinetic energy of the scattering particles. And I'll just go ahead and put the answer down there. This is what the answer turns out to be. And uh, we'll spend a handful of slides trying to show where that answer comes from, what the basic idea is. So let's get started. First of all, I want to introduce the concept of a Green's function, and I want to give you the mathematician's definition uh, for a Hermitian linear differential operator L with the boundary conditions on uh, L2. It, basically, it's a, a mm, vector space of functions that are uh, square integrable. Okay. Uh, if lambda is a real constant that is not in the spectrum of eigenvalues of L in the in the inhomogeneous equation, and the inhomogeneous equation is L minus lambda times the solution is equal to some source term f of x, then the solution is given by the integral of the Green's function. And I want you to look at the, the Green's function. It's an integral over uh, y, but the Green's function is a function of two variables, x and y. And the way you think about it, it's that the Green's function is a solution to the problem of a delta source. So the idea is um, if you have a delta source at y, what's the response of what will be the solution at x for a delta source located at y? That's kind of how you think of it. So that if you, uh, you want to ask what happens if I have a distributed source, you could basically think of it as a superposition of delta sources. Now, we already do this. You guys are familiar with this in the context of uh, electrostatic fields and the resulting uh, potential from uh, point charges. So a point charge is basically a delta source of charge. And once you know the solution to a point charge, you can calculate the potential to any distribution of charges by adding them up. That's basically what this is saying, except that um, the solution for a point charge, the static field of a point charge, is different than the solution of the Schrodinger equation for a point uh, mm, wave source, but it's, it's the same idea. So first of all, let's figure out what the solution to a delta source is. Well, let's say we could get the solution to a delta source, then we can get the solution for any source by adding up the solutions of a bunch of delta sources. So the idea is if we have some distributed source f of x, we could think of it as f evaluated at x1 times the delta function at x1 plus f evaluated at x2 times the delta function at x2, something like that. So you could think of the source as sort of an integral over point sources. And then if you want to know the solution, you simply find the solution to a point source. That would be the Green's function is the solution to the point source. And then to get the overall solution, you simply superpose all those point sources and add them up to get the solution for the distributed source. That's the idea. OK, so we could write out the solution as the Green's function for the point source at x1 times the Green's function for the point plus the Green's function for the point source at x2 times the size of the point source at x2 and so on and then add all those guys up to get the total solution. Okay, so how do we apply this to the scattering problem? Well we need to find a way to think about the scattering problem as a bunch of point sources whose solutions we can add up. So the idea is the operator L is going to become del squared. That's the kinetic energy operator from the Schrodinger equation. And uh, then the idea, this is uh, in the part of space where the Schrodinger equation is del squared. Then the, um, the eigenvalue, or the lambda, the thing that plays the role of lambda, is going to be the 
essentially k squared, the wave number squared, and, uh, and the source term is going to be the potential times the wave function. So we sort of flip the Schrodinger equation around, move the potential energy to the right-hand side, and the kinetic energy and the total energy, k squared is basically going to be the total energy, um, over to the left-hand side, and then it looks like this. So this is the uh, this is the the way the thing turns out. And um, notice that you can identify uh, f as the right-hand side. It's the source term, and so you can simply write down the answer once you know the Green's function. There are a couple of things I want to add to that. Um, you can add a solution to the homogeneous equation. Um, and it doesn't affect the solution, but it does change things at the boundary. So you have to be careful with the boundary conditions. And in the scattering problem, um, the incoming wave is a solution to the homogeneous equation. So you can add it outside the Green's function integral, and it doesn't have any effect on the correctness of the answer. Remember that uh, you can always add a homogeneous solution, and um, it doesn't because the because the operator acting on that is zero, it doesn't affect the right-hand side. Okay, so we can just write down the answer. What I want to point out is that it is the answer, but we have a trouble, and that is that the same solution shows up inside the integral and outside the integral. So unlike the case of the point charges in the electrostatic field, we can't simply integrate this because the thing we're after is inside the integral. So we have to come up with some kind of a strategy to deal with that. But first, we've got to figure out what g is. So let's find out what g is. It's a solution to this equation. It's a solution to the equation del squared plus k squared on the Green's function is equal to a delta function source. So how do we solve an equation like that? The easiest way is to take the Fourier transform. So we Fourier transform both sides. Um, in the Fourier transform, basically you're uh, converting from a sort of real space to sort of a momentum space, and we'll let the momentum be s, and then del squared on e to the i s dot r is just uh, minus s squared, right? And uh, so this formula, and the right-hand side, we just have a delta function. We take the Fourier transform of that, and we just get e to the isr, and you can see, looking at that thing, that uh, you can write down the Fourier transform of the Green's function right away. It's uh, quite straightforward. Now the question is, what's the Green's function? We're going to have to take the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of the Green's function, and uh, that's a little more challenging. Uh, it's a three-dimensional integral, so first we'll break it up into s, theta, and phi. Um, the phi is easy, there's no phi dependence anywhere, so you just multiply by 2 pi, that gives you the phi part. Then the, uh, the theta integral isn't too bad, you can use a u substitution there, and you end up with the result um, that looks like this, s times the sine of sr over k squared minus s squared. Now you'll notice k squared minus s squared is a difference of squares, so I can break it into k plus s times k minus s. And uh, also notice that because s is odd and sine is odd, that the product of the up of the numerator, that, that numerator is even, so I could actually uh, change the integral to an integral over all s, from minus infinity to plus infinity, and divide by 2, which is what I did. And uh, I want you to notice that that integral has problems. Um, first of all, it blows up at k equals plus s and k equals minus s. So uh, there are two poles on the real axis. It turns out the easiest way to do this is through a technique called complex contour integration. Now, this is uh, if some of you guys have had some complex analysis, you're probably already familiar with this. But the idea is there's a thing called Cauchy's theorem, which says that uh, if you integrate around a closed loop in the complex plane, that uh, you can deform the integral any way you like, and the result is the sum of the residues, the so-called residues, which are due to the poles that are inside the curve on the complex plane. So um, basically the way we handle this is to carefully uh, wrap the integral around uh, to make it a loop but we wrap it around 
at r equals infinity, and uh, there the infinity part doesn't contribute because we've got a 1 over r, notice, in the, uh, in the thing. Let's see, is that, am I saying that right? Um, actually, it's s that we're going to let go to infinity, but we're going to break it into the two terms, the e to the plus isr and e to the minus isr. The idea is we break this thing up into, break the sign into the e to the plus isr and e to the minus isr. And for the part of the integral where we let, we wrap the thing around uh, the positive imaginary infinity, then uh, the first term goes to zero because of the e to the plus isr. And the second term will wrap the curve around the minus infinity part, and that will let that term go to zero. Anyway, uh, I don't really want to too much get into the details of that. The most important part is the answer. The answer turns out to be easy. It looks like the scattered wave from our scattering wave function, basically. If I have a delta source, I get a response that looks like a scattered wave, e to the ikr over r, and uh, I can simply put that in, and you can see that the answer turns out to look like this. And we're going to make some approximations here. Notice we still have the unknown wave function inside the integral and in the answer on the left, and uh, we need to figure out how to handle that. And the easiest way to handle it is to make what's known as the first-born approximation, which is one, we say, look, we're interested in r much greater than the area where the potential is non-zero, so we'll let r become much greater than r0. And the second is, to the first approximation, scattering doesn't change much. So inside the integral, let's just put in the incoming wave and, uh, and see what happens. It works pretty well as long as v is fairly weak. So we'll go ahead and do that. Making r much greater than r0 means we can bring the 1 over r outside the integral. And then we're left with this monstrosity. But if you actually evaluate what um, psi 0 is, it's e to the i k z. You can put that in. And you get, the, uh, you get the following result. Notice I've got the incoming wave, e to the i k z. I've got my e to the i k r over, over r. And then on the inside, what have I got? This must be nothing other than the scattering amplitude. So we identify all the rest of the junk there with the scattering amplitude. And that is just an integral that, that we can do. I mean, it's not a terribly easy one, but it's, it's something you can do. Um, and how do we uh, get better answers if we don't like the first-born approximation? Well, we can, we can take the answer for the first-born approximation and stick it back into the integral again, and that'll give us the second-born approximation, right? And uh, then we can take that result and stick it back in the integral again and get this, the next one and, and so on. So you can actually uh, you can build up a series of approximations that involves uh, doing the integral multiple times using the incoming wave as the starting point. And uh, that be becomes the so-called Born series. What is it? It's a series of complicated high-dimensional integrals. Um, how do we do those complicated high-dimensional integrals? Well, one approach that we've already talked about is the Monte Carlo strategy. And just to illustrate that people actually do this, I'll track down a paper on uh, using the Monte, Monte Carlo method um, without using partial wave decomposition to get the nth Born series. And so it's exactly, it's exactly what we're talking about. So. Anyway, moving right ahead, that's, so that's the Born approximation. Basically, it's a nasty d integral that you can do to calculate the, the uh, scattering amplitude. And, uh, and probably it won't make a lot of sense to you until we actually sit down and try and do it. So we'll try and do a couple of those before, before we're finished. In the meantime, let's talk, get, get into some nuclear physics. I want to talk about something called the semi-empirical mass formula. Um, it's not in your book, but I'll, I'll put some papers on the uh, shared drive so you guys can, can see how it kind of works, but I want to give you a feel for it. Basically, it's a formula that you can use to estimate the energy, the binding energy of any nucleus, given its uh, 
number of protons and number of neutrons. And it's not exact, it's, uh, that's why, and it's semi-empirical, but it has uh, some theoretical inputs and it gets you in the ballpark. It gives you a sense of uh, whether something's gonna be stable or not, and if it's not, why isn't it? And that's a useful insight to have. So let's talk about it. The first effect I wanna discuss is the pairing effect. And it has to do with the fact that any given nucleus has so many protons and so many neutrons, and they tend to like to pair up, spin up to spin down. And we've, uh, we've already seen that. You guys remember the, when we did atomic physics and we talked about electrons and how they fill the orbital shells of an atom. It's a similar idea here, except instead of electrons filling a electronic energy states, these are nucleons filling nuclear energy states, but uh, it's energetically favorable for them to be paired up, spin up and spin down. You could have two different uh, isotopes, or two, I should say two different uh, nucleons with the same number of nucleons, two different nuclei with the same number of nucleons, but, uh, but you see one of them here has uh, eight protons and one has seven protons. The fact that it has eight protons makes it oxygen and the fact that the other one has seven makes it nitrogen. But notice that um, even though they have the same number of nucleons, because of the uh, fact that the nitrogen is odd odd, um, it means that one of the nucleons is up at a little bit higher energy. So um, these guys like to pair up and you can also see that there's an advantage to having an equal number of neutrons and protons because that keeps the energy levels about the same. Um, if the number of neutrons and protons were very different, you could lower the energy by converting some neutrons to protons. And that's essentially what happens. So um, there's also the Pauli exclusion principle, which uh, brings in some, some other ideas. Uh, Remember that exchange forces are attractive for symmetric and repulsive for anti-symmetric wave functions. So you remember that from uh, when we discussed the Pauli exclusion principle with electrons and atoms, but it's still true today, still true with nucleons and nuclei. And uh, also remember that the kinetic energy of a wave function is lower for a symmetric and higher for anti-symmetric wave functions. And finally, um, particles in symmetric wave functions can get close together. Particles in anti-symmetric wave functions are forced to remain far apart because there's a node in the middle. And uh, in, when we're talking about nuclear force, close together means lower energy, far apart means higher energy. So there are multiple reasons here why um, identical nucleons like to be in symmetric states. And of course, to be in a symmetric wave function, spatial symmetric wave function, you've got to be an anti-symmetric spin wave function. So that's another reason why they like to be paired up, spin up and spin down. Now, there's also the charge effect. So we know that uh, protons have charge, ne neutrons don't. So, and because uh, they all have positive charge, it means they repel each other. So that means that as the nucleus gets larger and larger, um, protons, uh, there get to be more and more protons, and that the fact that they repel one another starts to have an impact on the energy of the uh, nucleus, the overall energy of the nucleus. And so you don't see that the number of neutrons and protons stays equal as the size of the nucleus increases, and that has to do with the charge effect. The, the fact that the protons repel one another. So let's actually look at the Darn formula. It's the uh, semi-empirical mass formula. First of all, the a dominant effect is that the more nucleons you have, the lower the energy. And that's the so-called volume term. It just means that as you increase the number of nucleons, there are, there, uh, are more of them and each nucleus, each nucleon in the nucleus uh, has a bunch of folks around it and that adds to the energy. And so there's a first term that's just proportional to the number of nucleons. Then there's this, uh, this pairing term, the T sub C, and it's proportional to the difference between the number of neutrons and the number of protons. And we've already talked about that. That's due to the fact that they like to come in pairs. Then there's the 
uh, electrostatic repulsion term, and this is simply uh, the electrostatic energy of the protons. So notice it only has protons in it. Z is the number of protons. And uh, finally, there is the um, surface term, which means that if there are nucleons at the surface, unlike the ones that are deep in the volume of the nucleus, they don't have neighboring nuclei on every side. And so there tends to be an increase in energy. Notice it's a positive term. There's an increase in energy associated with um, the, the surface area of the nucleus. And since A goes like the volume, it goes like R cubed, then this term goes like R squared. Notice it's the cube root of A, which is proportional to R squared, which is going to give you an R squared term. So this is uh, proportional to the surface area of the nucleus. So. What are the terms? The volume term, the pairing term, the charge term, and the surface term. And we define T sub C to be half of the difference between the number of neutrons and the number of protons. So basically it's, uh, it's zero if there are equal number of protons and neutrons, and it gets bigger as, the, as there is a difference between number of neutrons and number of protons. So that's the so-called pairing term. There's one other symmetry term I want to discuss. Oh, and in uh, at least there are different people have used this formula to fit measured binding energies. And uh, they've discovered that uh, the coefficients that give the best fit over the largest range are these ones. Of course, there are competing fits that different people use for different reasons. But uh, this is one popular, popular uh, set of fits. Or set of coefficients, and uh, I oh I cooked up a little spreadsheet that I'm going to show you now that allows you to see what the consequences of this formula are, and uh, we'll take a little break here to just peek at that. Hi guys, so uh, let's see here we are. Here's a little spreadsheet I cooked up that uh, uses the Weissacker empirical mass formula. You can see it's a hideous expression in Excel, but Basically, what we've got here is uh, A going down the <coughs> left side and Z going across the top. Here are the expansion coefficients in uh, basically an MeV, more or less. And, um, and first thing I want you to notice is even with the numbers here, I can, I can see that there's a region of negative energy, and then it goes out to a region of positive energy. And so it follows along a line of Z equals N where at for low values of of z and uh and as as z gets larger of course uh, it tends to favor neutrons as opposed to protons because of the charge effect so it'll kind of uh, shift but uh the point is that the formula gives you qualitatively correct behavior and quantitatively reasonable but not exact uh and the example that i showed uh, earlier, or what we're going to talk about here in a minute, I guess, is um, A equals 46. Z is going to go um, in the 20s, kind of. That's the sort of calcium, uh, scandium, titanium in that region. And I went ahead and selected a few energies here just to show you how that works. So I can make a little scatter plot. And you'll notice that there is some bumpiness here, and that has to do with the symmetry effect. This is... Uh, this is um, the odd odd, or the these guys are even even, and these guys are odd odd, and so you get a bump in energy. But what that means is this guy's not stable, and I'll talk some more about that in a minute. But uh, anyway, that's the idea. The point is you can make a little spreadsheet to look at this formula and see how it works, uh, and get an idea of what's going on. And uh, Moving ahead, there is one other symmetry effect I want to mention, and that has to do with the uh, evenness and oddness. Obviously, the lowest energy is if both the number of neutrons and the number of protons can be even. Independent of whether the number of protons and number of neutrons are equal, there's also a benefit to having them be even. That means they're all paired up and everybody's happy. If there are even number of protons and an odd number of neutrons, or an odd an even number of neutrons and an odd number of protons. That's an even odd situation. That has a little bit higher energy. And the worst case is if they're both odd. If they're both odd, then nobody's paired up and nobody's happy. 
And so you can add a term to the semi-empirical mass formula that takes that into account, where the even-even case you take off a little bit, the even-odd case you leave it the same, and the odd-odd case you add a little bit. And uh, based on one popular uh, strategy for fitting the value of delta here works out to be 270 MeV. So um, if you put that in, you can explain uh, a kind of beta instability that happens. Here's an example, and I just use the mass formula to calculate these numbers, so they're not really exact. They're, they're in the ballpark. But, uh, but there's a one case where if you let the A be 46, we have potassium, calcium, scandium, titanium, and vanadium, okay? And uh, now some of these are not found in nature because they're so unstable. But for example, if you look at uh, uh, scandium or whatever, it's uh, A equals 46, Z equals 21. Notice that if Z is odd and A is even, it means N must also be odd. So potassium, scandium, and vanadium, they're all odd, odd. But calcium and titanium are both even, even. So even, even is more stable than odd, odd. And if you look at an even A, every other nucle nuclide, I guess, on the list is going to be odd, odd, even, even, odd, odd, even, even. Because they, the only way to get an even A is either for both Z and N to be odd or both Z and N to be even. And so that gives you a big energy difference. And notice that uh, by emitting a beta minus one of the uh, neutrons in scandium can change to a proton. And that will bump up its Z by one. And so scandium is unstable to beta decay to titanium. It's also unstable by electron capture to calcium. So there's two ways to to go down in Z, you can either emit a beta plus or you can capture an electron from the uh, atoms that are orbiting, the one of the S electrons in the, in the uh, atomic electronic structure and convert a, um, basically you're gonna, go, gonna convert a proton to a neutron. And so you're gonna go up in N and down in Z. And uh, also, uh, potassium and vanadium are also unstable. Um, it turns out a lot of the times only one of electron capture or beta plus emission occur because one is much more likely than the other. And so it isn't that the other is impossible, but it's just not measurably significant. So anyway, that's the idea. The point is using the empirical mass formula, you get a good idea. These numbers, by the way, were calculated from the empirical mass formula. So they're uh, ballpark but not, not exact. Um, the point is that you can get a sense of what's going on in terms of stability using that formula. And that's it for today.